and I went outside to check the mailbox, and it was a baggie of crack. Hmm. And at this age, I was like, I know what this is. I've taken health class, things mm, like that. Okay. So I was like, this is crack. And I took it. I threw it away. I smushed it all up, and I, I threw it in my trash can because I was like, this is a mistake. You know, there's no way. Five minutes later, I'm walking in, and my mom is walking out to the mailbox. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And uh, my mom went insane. I mean, she lost her mind. The crack was gone. She came inside, and she starts throwing things around the house. She's screaming at everybody to wake up. Mind you, my little brother at the time is, you know, he's five years younger than me. So he's scared. You know, nobody in the house knew at the time what was going on, I'm sure. Everybody had to come out in the living room, take our shoes off. She checked everyone's shoes. I mean, it was to the point where she was losing it. And she was, like, telling everybody that she had an important mail in the mailbox that had a check in it. And that check was going to pay the bills. And if nobody found the check, we didn't have a place to live. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I didn't find a check. I found crack. I was too scared to say anything. So till this day, my mom has no idea I took the crack out of that mailbox. Really? Mm -hmm. So today's episode is with Victoria. Now, even though Victoria doesn't use drugs, both of her parents were very much addicts. So this is an episode from a child's perspective. How does the parent's addiction affect the child? What feelings come from that? Confusion, anger, and why does the addict choose addiction over raising their own child? Or is it even a choice? Either way you answer this question, this episode right here shows you that those addictive qualities in her parents shaped who Victoria is today. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Drop a comment in the comment section. All those things help a little channel out, man. And hope you enjoyed this episode of Chopping It Up. Are you ready to do this for the second time? I'm ready for the take two. Outstanding. So take two. Victoria, outstanding. How are you? I'm You're doing well. You're looking well. I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Right. So I'm so sorry that we had a mistake. <laughs> it's all good i needed right. that was just like a practice right round. i'm a one-man band dude I'm a one, <laughs> in this little room right here right now i'm a one-man band i got a crew that's been so helpful because your pops has killed it the whole way good, down here good. for sure so is little scotty uh but this right here is definitely something that's it's all you easy to mess up as you just witnessed yeah so anyways introduce yourself tell us you know who you are how old you are why do you wanted to come on um uh, my name is victoria i am 23 um i am eric's daughter so I wanted to come on and give my side of the story because he has his perceptive and I have mine. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to talk about my life with active addict parents. Okay, so both your parents were addicts? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we were talking before the break, the mistake break. break. Yeah. Uh, when was the first time you noticed your parents, like you vividly remember? Um, I noticed my dad before my mom. Um, so I was nine years old. I lived with my Grammy, and my dad lived in the basement. And I found needles under the bed. And as soon as I saw him, I was kind of like, I've seen these before, but I was still really young. And like I said, both my parents were like functioning addicts at the time. So it was really hard to tell. But in the evening, I could tell my dad would nod out a lot. And at the time, I didn't know the term nodding out. Right. As an adult, looking back, it was very, very frequent every day, multiple times a day. You know, he'd say, oh, I'm just tired. Well, then when I saw the needles, I was like, you know, this sh th these are hidden. You mm -hmm. know, I shouldn't know where these are at. Mm -hmm. I left them, and then I started seeing more things like that laying around, needle caps, you know, things like that. Tin foil was a big thing. Mm. I saw tin foil a lot. Um, and so I waited about a month before saying something to my grandmother and then I would tell my Grammy, you know, I think my dad is sick. I think he's sick with something. He's, like, in bed all the time. And then she discovered the needles and kind of explained to me what was going on in a way that a nine-year-old would understand. Hmm. So that is when I first realized that my dad was, they said, you know, he is sick. He is a drug addict, and this is what this is. And so that is when I was like, my dad has a problem, and it's not something I can fix. Right. And then how about mom? My mom was a drug addict my entire life. Um, I don't know that I've never seen my mom high. Like, not high, I mean. Really? Yeah. So it was one of those things where I grew up with it and thought that that was normal. I didn't think she was sick like my dad. And then... Because hmm, um, you never had a comparison? Yeah. So I was... 
I was lost. I had not really discovered it until I ha- I was old enough to t- talk to my dad about his addiction. And that's when he was like, you know, the things that you're seeing at home is it, your mom is sick with the same thing. Um, I had found crack in my mom's mailbox. Uh, I was like 12, maybe a little younger. And a car drove by my house and, you know, it was a beat up car and it was two o'clock in the morning. Um, and I was walking my dog outside and well, my mom's dog and somebody dropped something off in the mailbox. And I was like, what the f-? And I went outside to check the mailbox and it was a baggie of crack. Hmm. And at this age, I was like, I know what this is. I've taken health class, things mm, like that. Okay. So I was like, this is crack. And I took it and I threw it away. I smushed it all up and I, I threw it in my trash can because I was like, this is a mistake. You know, there's no way. Five minutes later, I'm walking in, and my mom is walking out to the mailbox. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So you didn't see her take money out there or anything? No. Because she probably put money in the mailbox. They come and get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, my mom went insane. I mean, she lost her mind. The crack was gone. Um, She came inside, and she starts throwing things around the house. She's screaming at everybody to wake up. Mind you, my little brother at the time is, you know, he's five years younger than me. So he's scared. You know, nobody in the house knew at the time what was going on, I'm sure. And uh, everybody had to come out in the living room, take our shoes off. She checked everyone's shoes. I mean, it was to the point where she was losing it. And she was, like, telling everybody that she had an important mail in the mailbox that had a check in it. And that check was going to pay the bills. And if nobody found the check, we didn't have a place to live. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I didn't find a check. I found crack. I was too scared to say anything. So till this day, my mom has no idea I took the crack out of that mailbox. Really? Mm-hmm. That's crazy that she thought y'all was hiding crack in your shoes. Yeah. Telling oh. you to look for a bill. Yeah, it was. She made us take our shoes off. She went through our bedrooms. Our entire house got flipped upside down. We actually didn't go to school the next day because we stayed up until 9 a.m. looking for the bill, which was the crack that I knew I threw away. But I was too scared to admit it because I'd never seen my mom, like, withdraw like that. Like, she was definitely going through it. So where's mom now? She's incarcerated. For what? Um, possession of fentanyl, and she has four probation violations that are fentanyl-related. Hmm. Do you know how much time she's going to get? A, a year. Okay. It's mm-hmm. not terrible. Do you miss her? Um, I'm going to get really emotional about it. Um, I do. (laughs) I do miss my mom a lot. Um, I miss my mom before I realized my mom was an active addict. Hmm. Um, she didn't always do fentanyl. Um, before it was crack or meth or things like that. But fentanyl turned my mom into like a demon. Like it is not somebody I recognize. Um, but there are glimpses of my childhood that I can remember my mom being my mom, and I do miss that. Do you talk to her now from jail? She has called me one time. Um, she asked me for money. I did not do it. I, she was only in there three days before asking me for the money. Um, she seemed like she was doing well in there, as in getting high. Getting high in prison is very easy. Um, so she definitely was getting high in prison still. Um, before mm. she went to prison, she was in a rehab, court-ordered 28-day rehab, where she had made a phone call to me from a therapist office, explaining herself, admitting her wrongs, understanding what I was saying, and then immediately got high the day she got out. So it's, it's hard for me to understand how you can go back and forth, but she does it. Yeah, that's the part of addiction that's unsolvable. That's Mm -hmm. the part that none of us can really put our finger on and say, this is how we turn this switch on or off. Yeah. And then one day you kind of figure it out. Yeah, my mom has uh, gone down a really, it's been about seven years now since we really saw her go down a rabbit hole that I don't even know how to get her out of. She doesn't know how to get out of. It was, um, 
she had cheated on her husband, my stepdad. We had a house. <laughs> my mom doesn't have a house anymore, but we had a house we grew up in. My mom had a car, a job. She worked for the hospital. Um, she lost her job because she was stealing morphine from patients. Um, and she would come home and she would shoot it up. Hmm. And um, we would find bottles and needles laying around. My stepdad was a diabetic. We didn't think anything of it. Um, insulin comes in the same mm. bottle of morphine does. So we didn't think anything of it. And then uh, she was cheating on her husband, which was my stepdad, for 11 years of my life um, with a drug addict who she brought into our home and claimed to be a chiropractor. And uh, a friend of hers that was a chiropractor, and he helped her with her back pain and things like that. Well, my mom started doing pills for back pain. Mm -hmm. um, so when I saw him, I knew there's no way you're a chiropractor. Um, my mom would sneak out late hours of the night, stay at his house. Um, it got to the point where my stepdad found out about it. Um, they split up, but I had to call the police on my mom because my little brother is my whole heart and I grew up taking care of him and he went upstairs into my mom's bedroom and found heroin and picked it up and called me and was like I found this do you know what this is and I knew exactly you know it was brown substance it was in a baggie and I was like please put that down and then he looked around and there was a spoon and there was a needle and so I immediately picked up my brother brought him to my house and called the police and unfortunately the police couldn't do anything for me uh, because it was inside the home and they didn't have permission to come in the home and search the home. So all I wanted was to put my mom in jail to get her help. I thought that that would help. It actually ended up my mom becoming homeless, us losing our home, my mother never returning, my stepdad moving away, and I was left with no family here. Um, I had an, a boyfriend at the time that I lived with. And um, that was it. That's all. It, uh, it happened within a year. Burned everything down that mm -hmm. quickly, right? Yeah. My mom went insane. Um, she chose drugs over her children, her husband, her home, her car. She lost everything within a matter of a year and never looked back. <clears throat> yeah, that's hard, right? Yeah, it was difficult. Um, till this day, like, I live out here. Everybody that I know lives in Virginia. I live here. I don't have family here. I've created my own family and things like that, but I don't have a home here that is a childhood home. I actually I don't have a childhood home at all anymore. Um, and neither of my parents are, you know, living here. My dad is the only present parent that I have. Where, where, where are we exactly? We're in North Carolina, but what would you call it? It's close to Charlotte, right? Yeah, we're in South Carolina. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But we're about, so you know, 30 minutes from charlotte right because we're barely on this side of mm -hmm. north carolina right yep. hmm. so let me ask you this like throughout school do you remember being educated on drugs like because i feel like if these things are going on in your house and a teacher brings up one of these things it would have lit up a light bulb right yeah so um in middle school elementary school i i, I went to a lot of schools my mom moved around a lot uh, my dad, during my childhood, I would say, was in and out of jail more than anything. Uh, my mom had full custody of me, unfortunately. Uh, in middle school, I had a guardian ad litem um, during a custody battle between my parents. Um, she would follow me around school and um, kind of figure out what was going on in my life because school is one of the only places I was safe. I felt safe in school. Um, I was... I want to say I was in sixth grade. It was when my dad wanted custody of me. So they were in court, and um, I had bruises on me. My mom would hit me a lot um, growing up. And uh, we didn't have hot water. We didn't have food, things like that. And schools were noticing. You know, I, I would come, and I wouldn't be able to buy a school lunch, or I didn't have a packed lunch. Um, so they contacted the school counselor, which I had to go see every week, and then finally they contacted my parents, and then, you know, that's when the custody battle started. So I had a guardian ad litem that would follow me around, and I would tell this woman everything. I mean, I would come to school, and I don't even think that I remember going to class some days because I would s sit in an office with this woman, and she would ask me 100 questions, and I thought everything I was saying was normal. 
And this woman's facial expressions were like, like she would cry and she would look so sad for me. And she actually made a comment saying, you know, you know, I, I've always wanted children. At the end of this, you'll have a home even if your parents don't make you one, hmm. implying she would adopt me um, because my story was just so unrealistic for that age group. And um, I would tell her everything. I would tell her, you know, my mommy didn't come home last night. She, I don't know where my mom is. Um, there would be days that this woman would drive to my house because I was not going to school. I had no way to get to school. My mom was gone. So you're staying at the house by yourself? With my, I have, um, I have six step siblings, and at one point we all lived together. I had two older brothers, a sister, and two younger brothers, and we would stay at home. Me and my sister, we took care of our younger brothers while our older brothers would go to work to make money to pay for food. How old were your older brothers? Uh, at the time, maybe 15, 16, old enough oh. to just get a job. Yeah, it was it was terrible. We had to take, you know, we would change our little brother's diapers, and it was so bad. We didn't have food. Me and my sister, we would go to the dollar store a lot and steal food hmm. a lot. Um my brother, my little brother, got old enough to understand that he was hungry. If he didn't go and steal food, he was going to be hungry. So he would go and steal food, like ravioli, ramen noodles. Mm-hmm. We had to steal stuff like that because we didn't have food. Mm-hmm. We didn't, didn't have, have didn't have money. Mm-mm. We didn't have hot water most times. We would take baths after boiling water on the stove. And then, like, what for electric? How about no electric? Or electric was on, just no hot water? We stole electric from our right. neighbor. Right. Um, we got caught doing I've that. I've done that, and I've been caught. Yeah, we I've did get caught. I've done that, and I've been caught, yes. Yeah. Crazy <laughs> man. I never mm-hmm. knew that. Yeah. Excuse me for insane. cussing. I'm trying to take the cussing out. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I want to move on to your pops, man. I feel like y'all still have a decent relationship. Has that been something you've rebuilt on? Was that destroyed at one time? Like, take me through this process the way you just did with your mom. Okay, so I want to start off by saying my dad is my entire heart, my best friend. But it was actually not like that my entire life. Um, I was a kid, and I remember growing up, my mom made it very clear that she did not want me to go to the jail or prison to see my dad. That was not allowed. Um... I'm not really sure why, because my dad, you know, he would he would call once in a while. But now that I'm remembering, you know, they would say he was in the hospital. He was sick. Um, so as a very young, you know, five, six-year-old girl, I didn't know what jail was. Um, my, my family made it very clear to me that he was sick and he was in a, in a hospital. Hmm. So they didn't want me to go and see him. Um, so I remember going and seeing him in his first rehab um, in Edge Hill in Winchester. And my mom brought me there, and I swear it was like I met my best friend all over again. I didn't want to leave my dad. I wasn't allowed to spend the night there. Um, It was a very brief, you know, thing. Uh, He ended up going to jail after that, Mm -hmm. so I didn't get to build a relationship from there. Um, The first time that I remember starting a relationship with my dad was my 10th birthday party. It was the first birthday party I can ever remember my dad going to. Um, He was on probation. He had gotten permission. So me and my mom went and picked him up, and he got me my first uh, pink CD for my birthday. And it was like, I still till this day have that CD. Really? Mm -hmm. Anything my dad has ever gotten me, I keep. Um, He played soccer with me and my friends in the backyard. It was great he went to jail afterwards so it was any time that there was a slight chance that he could be a part of my life he would go to jail again um but I think it was due to uh, my mom having custody of me and him not really seeing that he had a chance at it so it was the goodbyes that were always really really hard for me and my dad um then I got old enough to understand what was going on um he got custody of me in middle school Uh, my mom went to jail for crack cocaine um, he got custody of me for about a year. We had a house. My little brother was in my life. Um, things didn't go very well at that point. Uh, it was about six months in. I started to notice my dad would put towels underneath his door frame. Mm. And I knew that that meant, you know, I'm not supposed to be in there. Um, I noticed him nodding out. I, have, I saw that. Um, I never found anything until the very end. I found needles under his bed. I was like, 
you know, this is happening all over again. But this time in my head, I was like, I don't have a mom to go to. I don't know where I'm going to go. Then my dad started taking me to my aunt's house up the street. I lived there. Uh, I didn't want to be there. I, I, I wanted to be with my dad. And I was like, felt like a pawn. I was pawned off on anybody that would take me at that point. I was in school and I was pretty much living out of a suitcase at the time. And I was going from my grandmother's house, my aunt's house, anything my dad could to keep me away from it, he did. So then our relationship started to fall off. And finally, I was like, I don't want to live with my aunt. I don't want to live without a parent. Like, I want one of them. And um, so I told them, I told my family, I said, my dad is on drugs. I, ha I found this letter in the mail, oh, in the trash can. It was a ripped up letter. I uncrumbled it and I, it was a note from my dad's girlfriend at the time admitting everything, saying, you know, Eric and I are supposed to get clean together, et cetera, et cetera. And she left that to who, to you? Uh, she left it in the trash can. I just dug through the trash can because I'm nosy, you know. I saw that my dad was having needles, you know. Right. I was trying to put two and two together right, and you're find investigating, something. But she wrote the note for who? I don't know. Okay. There was no dear anybody. There was. It was it's like, like a she journal was. Almost. Yeah. Okay. And she crumbled it up. It was on top of the trash can. I took it and I kept it in my book bag for about a month, um, hoping that things might change. Maybe my dad would get clean somehow. Mm. He didn't. So I took the note and I gave it to my Grammy, and my Grammy immediately knew what was going on and got me out of the house. I actually lost all of my items. I was never allowed to go back and say bye to my dad. I never saw my dad after that for years. Um. They gave me the option to stay and live with my aunt or go live with my mom, who had been clean at the time, hmm. fresh out of jail. I chose to go live with my mom. I was starting high school at the time. So I was like, you know, this is a, everybody needs their mom. Um, but I was not I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to my dad. And um, that destroyed me. I mean, it destroyed me that he chose drugs again after he had gotten a taste of the lifestyle of being clean. I was like, why would you do this to me? Why would you do this to my little brother? You know, and I felt, I was, I was angry. I was really angry. Um, I went to my mom's house, and I didn't speak to my dad for six and a half years. Hmm. And he would call from jail maybe once or twice if I'd answer, but I, didn't, I refused to talk to him for years. Because that just hurts you that much. Yeah, it was, uh, I needed a parent. I knew, everybody knew my mom was putting me in harm's way. I was... I was hungry, I was tired, I, w I was raising my little brother. I, I wanted a home, I wanted a parent, and I wanted guidance, and my dad knew that. And he, he helped me, and then he gave me a taste of what it was like to have a parent. He was a damn good parent, too, when he was clean. He was amazing. And then it was all ripped away from me with one needle. It was, it was taken away from me like that, and um, it destroyed me. I hated everybody, I was angry. It was terrible. So at this point in your life, you're just thinking that that you're not being chosen. Yeah, I. Like I they're picking this over me. I've thought that my whole life. It was, it was like seeing your parents, seeing your, that your parents have potential because you've seen them be good, and then them choosing not to be good makes you feel not worthy enough. Makes you feel like. What can I do to be better for them? Why don't they want me? Why do, do they want like the drugs? You still, do you feel like they're still choosing that? Like it's a conscious choice and they're looking at two options and they're saying, here's Victoria, here's crack, here's as an heroin, adult, I'm going to pick these. As an adult, I have realized that addiction is not that easy. It's not one or the other. It's not, it's not as easy as what it sounds like. Um, it, is, it is an addiction that is... It seems impossible to beat, especially looking at the outside in after time and time again of watching somebody you hope will change. Um, my mother, on the other hand, my mother till this day will choose the drugs. She has admitted you know, to my face six months ago, a year ago, I want to do drugs. I like drugs. I don't want you. I don't want a family. I don't want to get clean. That hurts. My father, on the other hand, um, he's almost a year clean. And um, he has never lied. You know what I mean? He's never lied about his addiction. Um, so I have a lot of faith in my dad. I have zero hope and faith for my mother. Zero. Absolutely none. Yeah, because I, I don't know. It's just uh, 
I feel like if you're walking around thinking that they chose those things over you, no. Yeah. They didn't do that uh, because I know I didn't choose it over my kids. Yeah. It's uh, something you just can't. Addiction explain. is not. There's no explanation to it. it. Took me a long time to understand that. It's. When you're a child and you, both of your parents are addicts, it's one of those things where it's like, who do I have? Who is going to guide me? And um, Who can I depend on? Yeah, I, growing up, unfortunately, I couldn't depend on either one of my parents. Um, when I was 14 years old, I, I met my boyfriend. Ooh, <laughs> I don't want to cry about it. Um, you I got me crying so you might as well <laughs> i um found somebody i could depend on um my mom had gone downhill um, my mom was uh, a terrible human being at the time and it wasn't it wasn't my mom anymore um and i had a boyfriend in high school and he was like hey i don't have drug addicts for you know in my life my his parents they were active addicts he had great grandparents and so he was like i can fix this What's up guys, just a reminder, hit that little like button right there and don't forget to leave a comment. Those things really help a small channel like this out. I hope you're enjoying this episode with Victoria. Now let's get right back to it. You know, I thought I was in love and I had somebody for once I could depend on, I could breathe again. I had somebody that was willing to take care of me and that's all I wanted growing up. You felt chosen, they yeah. picked you. Yeah. Hmm. How do you feel like all that has shaped how you look at drugs? Like all those experiences. Have you experienced drugs? Have you wanted to use drugs? What drugs have you used? Um, when my when I first moved back with my mom after my father had relapsed again, um, and I was starting high school, I immediately got into the wrong crowd. I was so angry. I felt like my dad had picked. I always use the term "picked a needle over me," and my mom picked pills over me. Um, and it felt like that for a really long time. And I was really, really angry. And so I was like, I want to do what they're doing. Maybe they'll pick me. Hmm. If I have what they want, maybe they'll pick me. Hmm. Um, I got in with the wrong crowd and I started doing, um, I did Xanax a lot um, for about three straight months. I did about three Xanax bars a day. I was doing them in school. I was buying them in school. Um, unfortunately... My mother at the time was a very bad alcoholic mixed with drugs. Um, so my mom was willing to supply everything to me hmm. by then. Uh, my house was the party spot. I was allowed to get drunk. My mom didn't care seeing me snort pills. She you weren't care. mad at her now. You weren't She picked me. Right. She, it seemed like she picked me. She, I was doing what she wanted to do hmm. so she could do it with me. And that developed a very, very toxic bond between my mother and I. Um, I did drugs for a little while. I actually, I, um, I had an overdose accident. I was unaware of what I was doing at the time. Um, I was home by myself. My mom had taken my brother to soccer practice. I had done one too many, and I had passed out on the bathroom floor, and I had thrown up. And my mom came in. It was actually my little brother that came in and saw me. Um, and that right there breaks my heart because my little brother is all I had to take care of. And he found me. And they took me to the hospital. And um, I had to stay there for a few days because they thought it was a suicide attempt. Mm. Um, and it was not. Uh, that's when I admitted that I did have a little bit of a problem. And my mom called my dad from the hospital, and my dad was so high, he didn't care, he didn't ask to talk to me. And so it was like the drugs that I had chosen to do, I was kind of doing them for my parents' attention, and it didn't work in the way that I wanted it to work. Um, and I could hear my brother when I was in the hospital, he was talking to God about how he didn't want drugs to take his sister too. 
And so that's when I decided that I would never, ever do it again. I never touched it again. I didn't want anything to do with it again. Um, my little brother is all I had at the point in time. We didn't have parents. We didn't have anyone. Um, so it was my priority to never mix myself with the wrong crowd again, and I never did it again. Hmm. So I have experimented with a few drugs. But only for the reason that shaped your life through your upbringing, too. Yeah, like I... You chose um, to do it for acceptance. Yeah. Because you couldn't get it. Yeah. Um, it was terrible. It was, it was a terrible part of my life, but at the time, I thought it was the best time of my life. I was having a great time. I had friends. Um, it was a new high school that I had started, so it was like, hey, this is easy. You get in with people that do the same stuff your parents do, you know. It was easy um, until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was stealing money from my mom to get what I had to get and fit in and do what I had to do to make sure that my mom still wanted me at the end of the day. It's terrible. <laughs> mm. And it's so hard to, like, uh, I mean, as parents, we didn't know what we were doing to y'all. And mm -hmm. I say we because I did the same <laughs> Um until we look back later and then you just look back with regret like i don't know it, because we can't change it right yeah but but we since we can't change it like we move forward so like what do you do for that like how have you do you think about it often do you take medications do you go to therapy um so i was in therapy from the age of four all the way till i was 18. i had the same therapist um she helped me as a child understand what an emotion was because I was angry at my parents, but I would act out in ways that normal children didn't act out. Um, I would lie a lot. I would lie about anything uh, just so my parents would be like, what did you say? And then have a conversation with me. Um, mm, for attention. Mm -hmm. I lied a lot for the attention as a child. Uh, my therapist helped me understand instead of lying, you know, you should say this to them. It was very hard to talk to my parents. They were high all the time or not home. Um, my step, I had a, I had a few stepdads, <laughs> a few of them. Um, none of them did drugs. They were just dicks. Hmm. They were just, they, well, you know, they were just assholes. Right. Um, but I looked at it as, hey, you guys are paying for my mom's drugs, so you're no better than her. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I was in therapy most of my life. Uh, when I became an adult, I didn't have insurance, I can't afford it. It also didn't seem to help me as an adult. Hmm. Um, so I went to a psychiatrist and I got on antidepressants. Um, I'm on anti-anxiety medication. Um, I was on blood pressure medicine for a while there because I had such bad anxiety, I would have high blood pressure. Wow. Um, as an adult now, I am, I'm very calm about the situation, um, mainly because I have my father back in my life. Mm -hmm. um, with my dad having cancer, it was really, really scary for me because it was around the time that I had developed a normal, well, normal relationship with my father. Um, I made sure, even, even when he was in prison, we talked every day. You know, he called me about me, and that's what mattered to me most is he wasn't calling about money or, mm -hmm. you know, anything to do with him and his addictions. Mm -hmm. He was calling about me, and that, was, that felt so important to me. I felt, you know, heard. And we would have regular conversations like I felt like I was supposed to have my whole life. Um, and so my dad got cancer and that that really screwed me up because I thought, hey, you know, I could lose my dad again and it's not to addiction. It's to something he can't control. And so that was really scary for me. Um, so I tried to develop another relationship with my mom thinking, hey, one parent's going to die. I need to have mm -hmm. another. Um my mother lived with me recently. Um, she was doing meth in my house, and she was sneaking men into my house. Um, she stole money from me. Um, she stole my car once, um, and I gave her everything. I didn't. I gave her a roof. I fed her, um, and she lied about it all. So I didn't know while it was happening. So I really was like, "Wow, I'm gonna get my mom back," and she would cry to me and be like, "I'm so sorry for what I did to you." And then she would shut the door and smoke meth in my house. And so I have a lot of hatred and anger towards my mother. 
Um, but I have realized that it is not something that I can control. It is not something that's my fault, but it still, it still really hurts. It still really hurts because my mom is old. She's getting, she's almost 45 years old. She's getting up there to be doing what she's doing, running the streets, doing drugs, in and out of prison. Uh, she doesn't have a home. She doesn't have a car. She hasn't had a job in years. So it breaks my heart to think that she may never have that again. Yeah, that monkey on the back, man, changes the character so much. Like, it, it just pulls your soul out. It does. It holds it ransom. And, and then when you guys get a glimpse of us again, it gives you hope. Yep. And then addiction is so unexplainable that you get a glimpse of the real person again and then you'll always have the fear that it's going to be taken mm -hmm. from you again so that was kind of going to be my next thing too like i know that like you've been let down a lot every time you would expect something good to happen it would be taken away yeah so like how has that affected you like with mom and dad do you still give them chances you feel like pops is going to keep going the right way or are you expecting him to not uh right now um uh, my dad and i have such an amazing relationship i i depend a lot on my father for my characteristics as to who i am today my dad um I'm, he, and i know y'all talk a lot like you just call out of the blue bang bang boom yeah. with a couple questions and you're out yeah I, my dad helps me through everything even the current addiction with my mother if i didn't have my dad through this i would not know what to do my dad has uh, helped me understand an addict's mindset during the whole thing so i'm not as hateful towards my mother i still am angry mm -hmm. towards my mother but he has helped me understand you know hey drugs are doing yeah. this and he understands how to articulate it to you to make you mm -hmm. understand yeah yeah and my dad has apologized and he i would say my dad has made up for a lot of lost time i'll never get the childhood back and i had a really unfortunate childhood due to my father not being present because when my dad is present he's a great dad and he's you know he's exactly what a dad should be unfortunately my dad wasn't present and i was you know sexually assaulted i was abused by my boyfriend i was I was put in really shitty situations. Hmm. And if my dad had had custody the whole time, I would have never been put in those situations. So you want to talk more about that? Is this the same boyfriend that you felt the attachment to? Yeah, um, we were together seven years. Um, I was a kid. I was 14 till 20 years old, you know. I don't know how many years that is. I can't really count. Whatever, that's, that's yeah. six, but it's okay. That's six, yeah. Um, <laughs> I looked at him as as God at the time, you know, he, I depended on him for everything. I didn't have a mom. I didn't have a dad on top of not having basic necessities. I had no ride to school. I had no way to work. I had, I had no food. I had nothing. His, his family, they took me in. They were, they were the best people I've ever met. I would say till this day, his family, they saved my life in ways I could never, I could mm. never repay them. Um, but he, uh, he was damaged. Uh, he had drug addicts for parents as well, and he, he had an anger problem. Um, as we got older, uh, he he just, he was angry. He, he was an angry person. He was scary. Um, he held me at gunpoint for two and a half hours um, because I said that I love my dog more than him. Uh, so he punched my dog in the face, and my dog was, you know, screaming. And so I went to protect my dog, and he said, you know, if you try to leave me, I'll kill you. And he held a gun to my head for two hours while I screamed and begged for my life. And um, I couldn't get out. I had no parents. I was stuck. You know, um, we had moved out on our own, so his parents weren't there to witness what was going on. Um, he would put my keys in a safe so I couldn't leave at night. Um, you know, held me at gunpoint. Um, he actually held a knife to my throat in his parents' kitchen, word for word, and said, if you try to leave me, I'll chop you up into pieces and put you in my freezer. If I can't have you, nobody can have you. I was terrified. I was terrified. It was the only man or person I could depend on. And if I left, I, I had nowhere to go. Uh, my mom had made it abundantly clear I could never come back. My dad was in jail. There was nothing my dad could do. Um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave and, and have nothing. 
So I stayed. Um, I tried to run away one time. Um, I borrowed $5,000 from my grandparents, and I had no car. I had no job. I had nothing. I packed my stuff in, um, in a suitcase, and my dad and his current girlfriend at the time were living at a motel. Um, he said he was clean, you know. He said he was doing good. And so I, I convinced my mom, who was, you know, money hungry at the time. I said, hey, if I give you $500, will you drive me to this motel in the middle of the night? And um, so I left in the middle of the night. He went to work the next day, and I was gone. Um, I had seen my dad at this motel, and I was like, oh, you know, this is a really bad situation. They also had no money. So my $5,000 was, you know, to a drug addict, that's gold. Uh, so my dad took a lot of my money uh, for drugs and food and, and whatever, but I was, I was away from my boyfriend. I was with my dad, who I thought could protect me. It turns out he wasn't really worried about that at the time. Um, he didn't care what the situation was as long as he had his fix. So I ran out of money. Um, I went back to my boyfriend. I called him, and I was like, you know, this isn't working for me. I don't have anyone here to depend on. I have to come back. So it was a failed attempt at getting out. Once I had done that, my boyfriend knew that I had capability of leaving, mm. and it got worse. It got better for a week, and it got immediately worse. Um, it was uh, to the point where I wasn't allowed to have a job. I couldn't have a car. Um, I couldn't go anywhere. I was secluded from my friends. Um, I wasn't allowed to leave the house. I wasn't allowed to wear makeup. I wasn't allowed to have social media. Um, he completely controlled my entire life. Um, and then I one day um, got a job and got a car. And I worked and I gave him all my money, so I said. And then I would split my paychecks in half. I'd give him half of it and I'd keep half of it. And one day in the middle of the night, I told him I was going to visit my family and I just never came back, ever. Uh, he blew my phone up. He went to my mom's old house and tried to hold my brother at knife point, like with a knife. My brother had to call the police and he, you know, he went crazy. He went to my friend's houses, harassed them. I changed my phone number and blocked him. And I never turned back. Hmm. It was the best decision I ever made. Um, but I also didn't have anywhere to go. I went and started from point A to point B. And, um, but the fact that you had the courage to leave, because some women don't leave. Some people stay in that relationship for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, if I stayed, I would have been killed. And uh, I did one of these with Terry, and her daughter was killed. Like, he literally walked up to her at a bar and shot the guy standing with her for no reason other than standing there. They didn't even have a relationship. And then shot her and then shot herself. And they all three died right there oh. over his obsession, over her saying no. And him having the same state of mind as if I can't have you, nobody will have you. Yeah. So when dudes say that, man, you got to take it serious. Like, that's yeah. not a joke. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was terrifying. I would sleep with one eye open. He slept with a gun right beside our bed in case he heard me get up in the middle of the night. Hmm. He would grab his gun like he was going to shoot me. It's terrifying. But I relied on him so much because my parents were active addicts. I had no one else. It was terrible. And I was a kid. I was 14. I couldn't get my own place. I couldn't get a car, a job. You know, I was, I was screwed. So let's talk about life today. How is life today? Like It's great. Okay. Um, I have my own home. I have a fiancé. Amazing fiancé. I have amazing animals. I have an amazing job. I'm blessed with, you know, financial freedom. I have a relationship with my father. I've come to terms with my mother. She is now serving a year in prison. Um, and if, if that is the way of her choosing life, I'm okay with that, you know, as long as it's not actively affecting me um, or my current family. Um, I have fears that my dad, you know, would relapse not on purpose you know when he was going through cancer I was terrified that those you know they gave him so many medications I was so scared you know this is an easy way to get hooked yeah this I is stayed, how it starts I stayed on him too man and believe me we slipped together you know yeah but I think he needs more of what you're giving him 
Yeah, he he is my best friend. That is all I have in this life. Um, my dad has been, in the last year, more of a parent in just one year than I've had in my entire life. And um, I would not be who I am today without what my father has, has given me. He's given me more knowledge than any school has ever given me. Um, I would not know what to do without my dad. And my life now is, it was worth it. Everything I went through, I would say was worth it. Um, it is the most amazing life I've ever had. I have, I'm blessed with amazing people. It is great. Um, I wish the same for my mother. Um, if I could have my mother um, in my life, I used to fear that I wouldn't have my dad. You got one of these things? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. I used to have fear that I wouldn't have anybody to walk me down the aisle. I got engaged a while ago. Oh, God. And my dad was in prison, and uh, I was I was terrified. I was like, I can never get married. You know, I have no one to walk me down the aisle. I have no, you know, maid of honor. Um, so my dad now, he has actually, you know, told me, I'm going to make sure I walk you down the aisle. <laughs> and that meant more to me than anything I've ever had. So I wish the same for my mom. Um. I would love to have my mom at my wedding, but if not, you know, I know she'll be there at heart, uh, but I do wish that she would get clean, because she has so many people that care about her, and it's hard to see when you're in active addiction, it's hard to see that people do care about you, because a lot of people are the tough love kind of people, mm -hmm. that's me, I try to keep tough love to prevent myself from getting hurt again, mm -hmm. um, but I do wish that for her. Oh, killing me. I know. I didn't think I'd cry. I didn't think this stuff <laughs> even made me this emotional. Uh, but I'm glad you can at least share the real shit, man, you know? Yeah, it's been a blessing and a curse all in one, but... It makes you stronger, but it's like... It, I didn't Why couldn't it. I go through something else to get strong, bro? Right. Like, I would have went to the gym every that's day. Yeah, that's what you I'm know? saying. I would have been a weightlifter by now. Right. Yeah, but it made me who I am, and I'm I'm forever grateful with, you know, the opportunity that my dad and I have today. Mm -hmm. um, I have so much faith in him. I, I don't see him ever going back. Um, but, yeah. You know, I think and it, I have so many comparisons in my head from so many different people that I've talked to, but mm -hmm. uh, my one of my best friends growing up recently died of fentanyl overdose. It's been about a, six months, eight months, something like that two daughters one's a little older than you probably one's a little younger than you it's heartbreaking right and like they didn't get a chance to do what you're doing i can't say that many people get the opportunity that i've had um uh i know a lot of my friends grew up with drug addict parents and it they've had a lot of unfortunate events where their parents don't come out of it a lot of people don't but so many people do and I, I want more people to understand the reality of doing it. Um, There's so many people that do, and it's so amazing to me. Um, my dad doing that, I, I am more proud of my dad beating addiction than anything I've ever been more proud of in my whole life. It is something that, that is the hardest thing you can beat in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely harder for some than it is others. And it when is. you see it take control of someone the way it has him or me yeah. or anyone, when you see him come out, you're happy. Yeah, yeah. You know, my uh, my kids lost their mom while I was in prison in 2004. Overdosed on alcohol and died. My daughter was like six months or a year old, year and a half. My son was like six. You don't take that shape their life, bro. Yeah. I it, was in prison. Come on, man. And then I come home and just act like a total all over again yeah that's usually that's usually how it goes uh, until you, you know you want to get clean mm -hmm. that's I always express that to my mom is you have to want it I can't want it for you well you have to become disgusted with it as well mm -hmm. there has to be enough loads that you're just tired of it. yeah there's yeah my dad says the same thing he's like I, I don't crave that right like I, I've been asking for a couple of years like aren't you tired of that cold dark cell and he thrives in jail Mm -hmm. he thrives if you've ever did. seen him in jail he thrives he oh, does he well he does exactly what he's you know there to do mm -hmm. 
and he falls right into it really quickly mm -hmm. and that's what scares me that's that is the most terrifying thing for me my mother being in prison my mother has never done more than you know a month two mm -hmm. months mm -hmm. being sentenced a year uh she actually called me right before going in and was just crying mm -hmm. and i was so sad i was like oh my gosh this breaks my heart for you um but she fit right in she fit right in and that's the most terrifying part is it is uh from what i've been told it's easier to get drugs in there than it is out here depends on where it is but yeah it yeah. could be it could be i mean yeah. i've definitely seen people go in and have a habit the whole time they're in yeah i was i was blessed to have my mom still alive um about six months ago, she overdosed and she died, and they brought her back to life with nine doses of Narcan. Mm, that's a and, lot. Uh, I had to see her in the ICU, and it was something that I swear I've never seen before. But I was so filled with anger, I looked at her and I said, "You can't even die right." Mm. And um, she, she called security on me. Uh, she did kick me out, um, and she told the nurse. The nurse had asked her. I spoke to the nurse. The nurse asked her, "You know, did you try to kill yourself?" And my mom said, "No." You know, I love doing drugs. I love drugs. When I get out of here, I'm going to go get high again. And that's what she told the nurse. And the nurse had told me that. And I said, you know, that's why I'm so angry. You're on your deathbed and you want to go get high. Um, it, was, it was one of the worst things I'd ever seen, seeing your parent in the hospital, pretty much on, you know, life support at the time. She had mm -hmm. a tube down her throat. And all she could think about was fentanyl. That is, like, that is the worst thing you could think about in the hospital. So, yes, you're right. You're right. Um, but how much clean time has she ever had? Because here's the thing I've, I realized, too, is because if, she, if you've lived 50 years and you only spent the first 15 of it clean, you don't even understand what it's like to be clean anymore. Yeah. Um, and the few months that you don't have drugs or you get put in jail is just miserable because you're withdrawing and you mm -hmm. never get a chance to feel what it's like to not have dope in your system. I unfortunately don't believe I've ever seen my mom clean for a period of time longer than maybe a week. And by that, I mean she was preparing for her drug test for probation. Mm -hmm. So she had to do what she had to do. Um, my mom has been on probation, I want to say, about eight years now. Mm. Uh, I mean, she's broken. She's been in jail I want to say 10 times. So I've ever lots of I've violations. A, oh, yeah. I have an album on my phone of just mug shots of my mom. Wow. They look like different people. It's so unrealistic. And every time she goes in, how long does she stay clean when she comes out? Oh, not at all? Not at all. Okay. No, so she goes in, uses while she's in, has a habit while she's in, keeps a habit when she gets out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And um, See, I think that's, that's a problem, too. Like, if you're going to lock up a drug addict into a place that gives them access to drugs right. you're not helping at all what are you doing other than oh the system is absolutely you know screwed right. not just jail but you know the courts i my mom got custody of me and my dad didn't and mm -hmm. my dad was clean and he was in therapy he was doing what he was supposed to do to get custody and the judge gave it to my mother I who, favor the woman 90 yeah the time. I, I mean i was sexually abused i was beaten by my mom my mom shoved us all in a trunk to travel nine hours to go to virginia hmm. so she could have room for her crackhead friends mm -mm. it's terrible we were in a trunk of a mustang it's awful like a hatch or a trunk a trunk wow it's terrible it's awful um but yeah she has never been clean longer than a week to pass a drug test she needs to go inside and be clean. She needs a consequence that, that is uh, getting your head straight. Yeah, she. Uh, my mom suffers with a lot of mental illnesses. She's bipolar, mm. things like that. So that mixed with the drug addiction, overall, I would say she's not the best person. And it's not just the drugs. Mm. It's It's got a lot to do with her untreated mental illnesses. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me see. If you had a mission statement, you know, my message to the world, Victoria's message to the world, what would it be? Um, I would have to say don't look at a drug addict the way that you're looking at a drug addict. Hmm. Uh, most people are looking at a drug addict as, as someone who doesn't deserve, somebody who doesn't have anything left, somebody who doesn't have anything to offer. Um. I would say don't do that. Uh, drug addicts, 
are drug addicts, yes. They're addicted to drugs, but they're people. They have families. Those people have families. They have people who want them home. They have children. They have jobs. They have, you know what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. have the potential that any regular person has. They just have and suffer from an illness that we can't understand. But that doesn't mean they're not people. My dad is one of the best people I know. And you as well. You're a great person. And, and if I could go back in time, I would not look at my dad as somebody who is nothing and no one and will never be anything. Because now he's the most amazing person I know. So I would definitely say don't turn your heads completely and say that they're nobody because they have family. They have children. I wish that a lot of people looked at my dad differently because he had a, he had a little girl at home that wanted him home, unfortunately. I, I had to wait a long time to get my dad home. But I did. <laughs> it's really sad. Uh, yeah. It's sad, man, but uh, at least we're rebuilding relationships with y'all. Because Absolutely. everything you say, I relate to my daughter, and that's why it kills me. Yeah. And the fact that he's my dude. But, yeah. Uh, I I've started to build that relationship with Paige, too. and it It's it means, amazing. It means a lot. I know that she is definitely so grateful for that yeah compared I'm, to a few years ago when she would be in the room beside me and wouldn't even come talk to me yeah i've been there yeah. i've been there it's one of those things where you're waiting on the shoe to drop the other shoe right and now i'm so right grateful. and that's what it was for her too and now mm -hmm. she sees that there's actually some hope in me not going back and mm -hmm. me not dying she definitely feels you... grateful that you finally chose right. her it seems like it's what it feels like to be a child of an addict And you can't make up for lost time, but the times that I've shared with my dad, beyond words, they are the most amazing memories that I've ever had. And I would not trade it for the entire world. All right, well, I'm going to close before I cry much more, dude. You're going to cry later anyways. Yeah, probably. So is there anything else you want to say? Like, is there a place people can find you on social media, send you a message if you want some, or you just want to leave comments under this oh, video? Oh, you can leave comments, or um, I have an Instagram. You can leave it. Like, I'll comment on the video. Okay. And I'll comment my Instagram if anybody wanted okay. to reach out. sweet. And I like to talk to people about yeah. stuff like this. I actually have wanted to start something where I could talk to teenagers and things like that. So if there's anyone out there, you know. Who needs somebody to talk to? I get it. All right. So start in this comment section right below. Mm -hmm. So drop a comment. Drop a like. If you're not subscribed yet, maybe this video will make you subscribe. And if you're still here at the end of this, then obviously it meant something to you, right? Yeah. I appreciate everyone. All right. Anything else you want to say? No, that's it. I'm going to go cry now. Okay. <laughs> thank you for having me yeah well thank you for making me cry of course i try not to cry on these things but y'all been killing me lately i know that's what this is about though man it's real it is it's real shit it's great it's good to be in touch with your emotions which is definitely something we have avoided yeah with mm -hmm. drugs you mm -hmm. gotta get you gotta you gotta realize it's okay to cry right all right man well till next time don't sweat the petty things. Pet the sweaty things. <laughs> <laughs>